Alfred the Great was king of the West Saxons from 871 to 886 and king of the Anglo-Saxons from 886 until his death in 899. He was the youngest son of King Ethelwulf and his first wife Osborne, who both died when Alfred was young. Three of Alfred's brothers, Ethelbald, Ethelberhide and Ethelred, reigned in turn before him. Under Alfred's rule, considerable administrative and military reforms were introduced, prompting lasting change in England. After ascending the throne, Alfred spent several years fighting Viking invasions. He won a decisive victory in the Battle of Eddington in 878 and made an agreement with the Vikings, dividing England between Anglo-Saxon territory and the Viking-ruled Danelaw, composed of Northern England, the Northeast Midlands and East Anglia. Alfred also oversaw the conversion of Viking leader Guthrum to Christianity. He defended his kingdom against the Viking attempt at conquest, becoming the dominant ruler in England. Alfred began styling himself as King of the Anglo-Saxons after reoccupying London from the Vikings. Details of his life are described in a work by 9th-century Welsh scholar and Bishop Asser. Alfred had a reputation as a learned and merciful man of a gracious and level-headed nature who encouraged education, proposing that primary education be conducted in English, rather than Latin, and improving the legal system and military structure and his people's quality of life. He was given the epithet the Great in the 16th century and is only one of two English monarchs, alongside Nut the Great, to be labelled as such. Family Alfred was a son of Ethelwulf, king of Wessex, and his wife Osborne. According to his biographer, Asser, writing in 893, in the year of our Lord's Incarnation 849 Alfred, king of the Anglo-Saxons, was born at the royal estate called Wantage, in the district known as Berkshire. This date has been accepted by the editors of Asser's biography, Simon Keynes and Michael Lappage, and by other historians such as David Dumville and Richard Huscroft. West Saxon genealogical lists state that Alfred was 23 when he became king in April 871, implying that he was born between April 847 and April 848. This dating is adopted in the biography of Alfred by Alfred Smith, who regards Asser's biography as fraudulent, an allegation which is rejected by other historians. Richard Abels in his biography discusses both sources but does not decide between them and dates Alfred's birth as 847-849, while Patrick Warmelt in his Oxford Dictionary of National Biography article dates at 848-849. Berkshire had been historically disputed between Wessex and the Midland Kingdom of Mercia, and as late as 844, a charter showed that it was part of Mercia but Alfred's birth in the county is evidence that, by the late 840s, control had passed to Wessex. He was the youngest of six children. His eldest brother, Ethelstan, was old enough to be appointed sub-king of Kent in 839, almost ten years before Alfred was born. He died in the early 850s. Alfred's next three brothers were successively kings of Wessex. Ethelbald and Ethelberheit were also much older than Alfred, but Ethelred was only a year or two older. Alfred's only known sister, Ethelswith, married Burgred, king of Mercia in 853. Most historians think that Osper was the mother of all Ethelwulf's children, but some suggest that the older ones were born to an unrecorded first wife. Osper was descended from the rulers of the Isle of Wight. She was described by Alfred's biographer Asser as a most religious woman, noble by temperament and noble by birth. She had died by 856 when Ethelwulf married Judith, daughter of Charles the Bald, king of West Francia. In 868, Alfred married Ilhaswith, daughter of the Mercian nobleman Ethelred Musel, alderman of the Gany, and his wife Edburh, who was of royal Mercian descent. Their children were Ethelflaed, who married Ethelred, Lord of the Mercians, 
Edward the Elder, Alfred's successor as king, Ethelgefu, abbess of Shaftesbury, Ilthrith, who married Baldwin, Count of Flanders, and Ethelward. Background Alfred's grandfather, Ekberheit, became king of Wessex in 802, and in the view of the historian Richard Abels, it must have seemed very unlikely to contemporaries that he would establish a lasting dynasty. For 200 years, three families had fought for the West Saxon throne, and no son had followed his father as king. No ancestor of Ekberheit had been a king of Wessex since C. Allen in the late 6th century, but he was believed to be a paternal descendant of Serdic, the founder of the West Saxon dynasty. This made Ekberheit and Ethelin a prince eligible for the throne. But after Ekberheit's reign, descent from Serdic was no longer sufficient to make a man an Ethelin. When Ekberheit died in 839, he was succeeded by his son Ethelwulf. All subsequent West Saxon kings were descendants of Ekberheit and Ethelwulf, and were also sons of kings. At the beginning of the 9th century, England was almost wholly under the control of the Anglo Saxons. Mercia dominated southern England, but its supremacy came to an end in 825 when it was decisively defeated by Ekberheit at the Battle of Elendun. The two kingdoms became allies which was important in the resistance to Viking attacks. In 853, King Burgred of Mercia requested West Saxon help to suppress a Welsh rebellion, and Ethelwulf led a West Saxon contingent in a successful joint campaign. In the same year Burgred married Ethelwulf's daughter, Ethelswith. In 825, Ekberheit sent Ethelwulf to invade the Mercian subkingdom of Kent, and its subking, Baldred was driven out shortly afterwards. By 830, Essex, Surrey and Sussex had submitted to Ekberheit, and he had appointed Ethelwulf to rule the southeastern territories as King of Kent. The Vikings ravaged the Isle of Sheppey in 835, and the following year they defeated Ekberheit at Carhampton in Somerset, but in 838 he was victorious over an alliance of Cornishmen and Vikings at the Battle of Hingston Down reducing Cornwall to the status of a client kingdom. When Ethelwulf succeeded, he appointed his eldest son Ethelstan as sub-king of Kent. Ekberheit and Ethelwulf may not have intended a permanent union between Wessex and Kent because they both appointed sons as sub-kings, and charters in Wessex were attested by West Saxon magnates, while Kentish charters were witnessed by the Kentish elite, both kings kept overall control and the sub-kings were not allowed to issue their own coinage. Viking raids increased in the early 840s on both sides of the English Channel, and in 843 Ethelwulf was defeated at Carhampton. In 850, Ethelstan defeated a Danish fleet off Sandwich in the first recorded naval battle in English history. In 851 Ethelwulf and his second son, Ethelbald, defeated the Vikings at the Battle of Akeley and, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there made the greatest slaughter of a heathen raiding army that we have heard tell of up to this present day, and there took the victory. Ethelwulf died in 858 and was succeeded by his oldest surviving son, Ethelbald, as King of Wessex and by his next oldest son, Ethelberheit, as King of Kent. Ethelbald only survived his father by two years, and Ethelberheit then for the first time united Wessex and Kent into a single kingdom. Childhood According to Asser, in his childhood Alfred won a beautifully decorated book of English poetry, offered as a prize by his mother to the first of her sons able to memorize it. He must have had it read to him because his mother died when he was about six and he did not learn to read until he was twelve. In 853, Alfred is reported by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to have been sent to Rome where he was confirmed by Pope Leo IV, who anointed him as king. Victorian writers later interpreted this as an anticipatory coronation in preparation for his eventual succession to the throne of Wessex. This is unlikely, his succession could not have been foreseen at the time because Alfred had three living elder brothers. 
A letter of Leo IV shows that Alfred was made a consul and a misinterpretation of this investiture, deliberate or accidental, could explain later confusion. It may be based upon the fact that Alfred later accompanied his father on a pilgrimage to Rome where he spent some time at the court of Charles the Bald, King of the Franks, around 854-855. On their return from Rome in 856, Ethelwulf was deposed by his son Ethelbald. With civil war looming, the magnates of the realm met in council to form a compromise. Ethelbald retained the western shires, and Ethelwulf ruled in the east. After King Ethelwulf died in 858, Wessex was ruled by three of Alfred's brothers in succession, Ethelbald, Ethelberheit, and Ethelred. The Reigns of Alfred's Brothers Alfred is not mentioned during the short reigns of his older brothers Ethelbald and Ethelberheit. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes the great heathen army of Danes landing in East Anglia with the intent of conquering the four kingdoms which constituted Anglo-Saxon England in 865. Alfred's public life began in 865 at age 16 with the accession of his third brother, 18-year-old Ethelred. During this period, Bishop Asser gave Alfred the unique title of Secundarius, which may indicate a position similar to the Celtic Tanist, a recognized successor closely associated with the reigning monarch. This arrangement may have been sanctioned by Alfred's father or by the Witton to guard against the danger of a disputed succession should Ethelred fall in battle. It was a well-known tradition among other Germanic peoples, such as the Swedes and Franks to whom the Anglo-Saxons were closely related, to crown a successor as royal prince and military commander. Viking Invasion In 868, Alfred was recorded as fighting beside Ethelred in a failed attempt to keep the great heathen army led by Ivor the Boneless out of the adjoining kingdom of Mercia. The Danes arrived in his homeland at the end of 870, and nine engagements were fought in the following year, with mixed results, the places and dates of two of these battles have not been recorded. A successful skirmish at the Battle of Englefield in Berkshire on December 31, 870 was followed by a severe defeat at the siege and the Battle of Reading by Ivar's brother Halfdan Ragnarsson on January 5, 871. Four days later, the Anglo-Saxons won a victory at the Battle of Ashdown on the Berkshire Downs, possibly near Compton or Aldworth. The Saxons were defeated at the Battle of Basing on January 22. They were defeated again on March 22 at the Battle of Merton. Ethelred died shortly afterwards in April. King at War Early Struggles In April 871 King Ethelred died and Alfred acceded to the throne of Wessex and the burden of its defence, even though Ethelred left two underage sons, Ethelhelm and Ethelwold. This was in accordance with the agreement that Ethelred and Alfred had made earlier that year in an assembly at an unidentified place called Swinbiorg. The brothers had agreed that whichever of them outlived the other would inherit the personal property that King Ethelwulf had left jointly to his sons in his will. The deceased sons would receive only whatever property and riches their father had settled upon them and whatever additional lands their uncle had acquired. The unstated premise was that the surviving brother would be king. Given the Danish invasion and the youth of his nephews, Alfred's accession probably went uncontested. While he was busy with the burial ceremonies for his brother, the Danes defeated the Saxon army in his absence at an unnamed spot and then again in his presence at Wilton in May. The defeat at Wilton smashed any remaining hope that Alfred could drive the invaders from his kingdom. Alfred was forced instead to make peace with them. Although the terms of the peace are not recorded, Bishop Asser wrote that the pagans agreed to vacate the realm and made good their promise. The Viking army withdrew from Reading in the autumn of 871 to take up winter quarters in Mercian London. Although not mentioned by Asser or by the Anglo Saxon Chronicle, Alfred probably paid the Vikings cash to leave, much as the Mercians were to do in the following year. Hordes dating to the Viking occupation of London in 871-872 have been excavated at Croydon, Gravesend, and Waterloo Bridge. 
These finds hint at the cost involved in making peace with the Vikings. For the next five years, the Danes occupied other parts of England. In 876, under their three leaders Guthrum, Ossetel, and Anwind, the Danes slipped past the Saxon army and attacked and occupied Wareham in Dorset. Alfred blockaded them but was unable to take Wareham by assault. He negotiated a peace that involved an exchange of hostages and oaths, which the Danes swore on a holy ring associated with the worship of Thor. The Danes broke their word, and after killing all the hostages, slipped away under cover of night to Exeter in Devon. Alfred blockaded the Viking ships in Devon, and with a relief fleet having been scattered by a storm, the Danes were forced to submit. The Danes withdrew to Mercia. In January 878, the Danes made a sudden attack on Chippenham, a royal stronghold in which Alfred had been staying over Christmas and most of the people they killed, except the King Alfred, and he with a little band made his way by wood and swamp, and after Easter he made a fort at Athelney in the marshes of Somerset, and from that fort kept fighting against the foe. From his fort at Athelney, an island in the marshes near North Petherton, Alfred was able to mount a resistance campaign, rallying the local militias from Somerset, Wiltshire, and Hampshire. 878 was the nadir of the history of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. With all the other kingdoms having fallen to the Vikings, Wessex alone was resisting. The Cake Legend A legend tells how when Alfred first fled to the Somerset levels, he was given shelter by a peasant woman who, unaware of his identity, left him to watch some wheaten cakes she had left cooking on the fire. Preoccupied with the problems of his kingdom, Alfred accidentally let the cakes burn and was roundly scolded by the woman upon her return. There is no contemporary evidence for the legend, but it is possible that there was an early oral tradition. The first known written account of the incident is from about 100 years after Alfred's death. Counter-attack and victory In the seventh week after Easter, around Whitsuntide, Alfred rode to Egbert's Stone east of Selwood where he was met by all the people of Somerset and of Wiltshire and of that part of Hampshire which is on this side of the sea, and they rejoiced to see him. Alfred's emergence from his marshland stronghold was part of a carefully planned offensive that entailed raising the FYRDS of three shires. This meant not only that the king had retained the loyalty of aldermen, royal reeves, and king's thanes, who were charged with levying and leading these forces, but that they had maintained their positions of authority in these localities well enough to answer his summons to war. Alfred's actions also suggest a system of scouts and messengers. Alfred won a decisive victory in the ensuing Battle of Eddington, which may have been fought near Westbury, Wiltshire. He then pursued the Danes to their stronghold at Chippenham and starved them into submission. One of the terms of the surrender was that Guthrum convert to Christianity. Three weeks later, the Danish king and 29 of his chief men were baptized at Alfred's court at Aller, near Athelney, with Alfred receiving Guthrum as his spiritual son. According to Asser, the unbinding of the chrism on the eighth day took place at a royal estate called Wedmore. At Wedmore, Alfred and Guthrum negotiated what some historians have called the Treaty of Wedmore, but it was to be some years after the cessation of hostilities that a formal treaty was signed. Under the terms of the so-called Treaty of Wedmore, the converted Guthrum was required to leave Wessex and return to East Anglia. Consequently, in 879 the Viking army left Chippenham and made its way to Cirencester. The formal treaty of Alfred and Guthrum, preserved in Old English in Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and in a Latin compilation known as Quadripartitus, was negotiated later, perhaps in 879 or 880, when King Saulwulf II of Mercia was deposed. That treaty divided up the Kingdom of Mercia. By its terms, the boundary between Alfred's and Guthrum's kingdoms was to run up the River Thames to the River Lee follow the Lee to its source, from their extent in a straight line to Bedford, and from Bedford follow the River Ouse to Waddling Street. Alfred succeeded to see Olwulf's kingdom consisting of western Mercia, 
and Guthrum incorporated the eastern part of Mercia into an enlarged kingdom of East Anglia. By terms of the treaty, moreover, Alfred was to have control over the Mercian city of London and its mints at least for the time being. In 825, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle had recorded that the people of Essex, Sussex, Kent and Surrey surrendered to Egbert, Alfred's grandfather. From then until the arrival of the great heathen army, Essex had formed part of Wessex. After the foundation of Danelaw, it appears that some of Essex would have been ceded to the Danes, but how much is not clear. 880s With the signing of the Treaty of Alfred and Guthrum, an event most commonly held to have taken place around 880 when Guthrum's people began settling East Anglia, Guthrum was neutralized as a threat. The Viking army, which had stayed at Fulham during the winter of 878-879, sailed for Ghent and was active on the continent from 879 to 892. There were local raids on the coast of Wessex throughout the 880s. In 882, Alfred fought a small sea battle against four Danish ships. Two of the ships were destroyed, and the others surrendered. This was one of four sea battles recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, three of which involved Alfred. Similar small skirmishes with independent Viking raiders would have occurred for much of the period as they had for decades. In 883, Pope Marinus exempted the Saxon quarter in Rome from taxation, probably in return for Alfred's promise to send alms annually to Rome, which may be the origin of the medieval tax called Peter's Pence. The Pope sent gifts to Alfred, including what was reputed to be a piece of the true cross. After the signing of the treaty with Guthrum, Alfred was spared any large scale conflicts for some time. Despite this relative peace, the king was forced to deal with a number of Danish raids and incursions. Among these was a raid in Kent, an allied kingdom in southeast England, during the year 885 which was possibly the largest raid since the battles with Guthrum. Asser's account of the raid places the Danish raiders at the Saxon city of Rochester, where they built a temporary fortress in order to besiege the city. In response to this incursion, Alfred led an Anglo-Saxon force against the Danes who, instead of engaging the army of Wessex, fled to their beached ships and sailed to another part of Britain. The retreating Danish force supposedly left Britain the following summer. Not long after the failed Danish raid in Kent, Alfred dispatched his fleet to East Anglia. The purpose of this expedition is debated, but Asser claims that it was for the sake of plunder. After travelling up the river Stour, the fleet was met by Danish vessels that numbered 13 or 16, and a battle ensued. The Anglo Saxon fleet emerged victorious and as Henry of Huntingdon writes, laden with spoils. The victorious fleet was surprised when attempting to leave the river Stour and was attacked by a Danish force at the mouth of the river. The Danish fleet defeated Alfred's fleet, which may have been weakened in the previous engagement. King of the Anglo-Saxons A year later, in 886, Alfred reoccupied the city of London and set out to make it habitable again. Alfred entrusted the city to the care of his son-in-law Ethelred, alderman of Mercia. Soon afterwards, Alfred restyled himself as King of the Anglo-Saxons. The restoration of London progressed through the latter half of the 880s and is believed to have revolved around a new street plan, added fortifications in addition to the existing Roman walls, and, some believe, the construction of matching fortifications on the south bank of the River Thames. This is also the period in which almost all chroniclers agree that the Saxon people of pre unification England submitted to Alfred. In 888, Ethelred, the Archbishop of Canterbury, also died. One year later, Guthrum, or Athelstan by his baptismal name, Alfred's former enemy and king of East Anglia, died and was buried in Hadla. Suffolk. Guthrum's death changed the political landscape for Alfred. The resulting power vacuum stirred other power-hungry warlords eager to take his place in the following years. 
The quiet years of Alfred's life were coming to a close. Viking Attacks After another lull, in the autumn of 892 or 893, the Danes attacked again. Finding their position in mainland Europe precarious, they crossed to England in 330 ships in two divisions. They entrenched themselves, the larger body at Appledore, Kent, and the lesser under Hastine, at Milton, also in Kent. The invaders brought their wives and children with them, indicating a meaningful attempt at conquest and colonization. Alfred, in 893 or 894, took up a position from which he could observe both forces. While he was in talks with Hastine, the Danes at Appledore broke out and struck northwestwards. They were overtaken by Alfred's eldest son, Edward, and were defeated at the Battle of Farnham in Surrey. They took refuge on an island at Thorny, on the River Colne between Buckinghamshire and Middlesex, where they were blockaded and forced to give hostages and promise to leave Wessex. They then went to Essex and after suffering another defeat at Ben Flate, joined with Hastings' force at Shoebury. Alfred had been on his way to relieve his son at Thorny when he heard that the Northumbrian and East Anglian Danes were besieging Exeter and an unnamed stronghold on the North Devon shore. Alfred at once hurried westward and raised the siege of Exeter. The fate of the other place is not recorded. The force under Hastine set out to march up the Thames Valley, possibly with the idea of assisting their friends in the west. They were met by a large force under the three great aldermen of Mercia, Wiltshire, and Somerset and forced to head off to the northwest, being finally overtaken and blockaded at Buddington. An attempt to break through the English lines failed. Those who escaped retreated to Shoebury. After collecting reinforcements, they made a sudden dash across England and occupied the ruined Roman walls of Chester. The English did not attempt a winter blockade but contented themselves with destroying all the supplies in the district. Early in 894 or 895, lack of food obliged the Danes to retire once more to Essex. At the end of the year, the Danes drew their ships up the River Thames and the River Lee and fortified themselves 20 miles north of London. A frontal attack on the Danish lines failed but later in the year, Alfred saw a means of obstructing the river to prevent the egress of the Danish ships. The Danes realized that they were outman over it, struck off northwestwards and wintered at Quatbridge near Bridge North. The next year, 896, they gave up the struggle. Some retired to Northumbria, some to East Anglia. Those who had no connections in England returned to the continent. Military Reorganization The Germanic tribes who invaded Britain in the 5th and 6th centuries relied upon the unarmoured infantry supplied by their tribal levy, or FYRD, and it was upon this system that the military power of the several kingdoms of early Anglo-Saxon England depended. The FYRD was a local militia in the Anglo-Saxon Shire in which all freemen had to serve, those who refused military service were subject to fines or loss of their land. According to the Law Code of King Ione of Wessex, issued in C-694, if a nobleman who holds land neglects military service, he shall pay 120 shillings and forfeit his land. A nobleman who holds no land shall pay sixty shillings, a commoner shall pay a fine of thirty shillings for neglecting military service. Wessex's history of failures preceding Alfred's success in 878 emphasized to him that the traditional system of battle he had inherited played to the Danes' advantage. While the Anglo Saxons and the Danes attacked settlements for plunder, they employed different tactics. In their raids the Anglo-Saxons traditionally preferred to attack head-on by assembling their forces in a shield wall, advancing against their target and overcoming the oncoming wall marshalled against them in defence. The Danes preferred to choose easy targets, mapping cautious forays to avoid risking their plunder with high-stake attacks for more. Alfred determined their tactic was to launch small attacks from a secure base to which they could retreat should their raiders meet strong resistance. The bases were prepared in advance, often by capturing an estate and augmenting its defences with ditches, ramparts and palisades. 
Once inside the fortification, Alfred realized, the Danes enjoyed the advantage, better situated to outlast their opponents or crush them with a counter-attack because the provisions and stamina of the besieging forces waned. The means by which the Anglo-Saxons marshaled forces to defend against marauders also left them vulnerable to the Vikings. It was the responsibility of the Shire FYRD to deal with local raids. The king could call up the national militia to defend the kingdom but in the case of the Viking raids, problems with communication and raising supplies meant that the national militia could not be mustered quickly enough. It was only after the raids had begun that a call went out to landowners to gather their men for battle. Large regions could be devastated before the FYRD could assemble and arrive. Although the landowners were obliged to the king to supply these men when called, during the attacks in 878 many of them abandoned their king and collaborated with Guthrum. With these lessons in mind Alfred capitalized on the relatively peaceful years following his victory at Eddington with an ambitious restructuring of Saxon defences. On a trip to Rome Alfred had stayed with Charles the Bald, and it is possible that he may have studied how the Carolingian kings had dealt with Viking raiders. Learning from their experiences he was able to establish a system of taxation and defense for Wessex. There had been a system of fortifications in pre-Viking Mercia that may have been an influence. When the Viking raids resumed in 892 Alfred was better prepared to confront them with a standing, mobile field army, a network of garrisons and a small fleet of ships navigating the rivers and estuaries. Administration and Taxation Tenants in Anglo-Saxon England had a threefold obligation based on their land holding, the so-called common burdens of military service, fortress work, and bridge repair. This threefold obligation has traditionally been called trinoda necessitas or trimoda necessitas. The old English name for the fine due for neglecting military service was fierd wheat. To maintain the buzz, and to reorganize the FYRD as a standing army, Alfred expanded the tax and conscription system based on the productivity of a tenant's land holding. The hide was the basic unit of the system on which the tenant's public obligations were assessed. A hide is thought to represent the amount of land required to support one family. The hide differed in size according to the value and resources of the land and the landowner would have to provide service based on how many hides he owned. Burgle System the foundation of Alfred's new military defense system was a network of buzz, distributed at tactical points throughout the kingdom. There were 33 buzz, about 30 kilometers apart, enabling the military to confront attacks anywhere in the kingdom within a day. Alfred's buzz ranged from former Roman towns, such as Winchester, where the stone walls were repaired and ditches added, to massive earthen walls surrounded by wide ditches probably reinforced with wooden revetments and palisades, such as at Burfham in West Sussex. The size of the buzz ranged from tiny outposts such as Pileton in Devon, to large fortifications in established towns, the largest being at Winchester. A document now known as the Burgle Hydage provides an insight into how the system worked. It lists the hydage for each of the fortified towns contained in the document. Wallingford had a hidage of 2,400, which meant that the landowners there were responsible for supplying and feeding 2,400 men, the number sufficient for maintaining 9,900 feet of wall. A total of 27,071 soldiers were needed, approximately one in four of all the free men in Wessex. Many of the buzz were twin towns that straddled a river and were connected by a fortified bridge like those built by Charles the Bald a generation before. The double bob blocked passage on the river, forcing Viking ships to navigate under a garrisoned bridge lined with men armed with stones, spears or arrows. Other bas were sighted near fortified royal villas, allowing the king better control over his strongholds. The bas were connected by a road system maintained for army use. The roads allowed an army quickly to be assembled, sometimes from more than one bay, to confront the Viking invader. The road network posed significant obstacles to Viking invaders, especially those laden with booty. 
the system threatened Viking routes and communications making it far more dangerous for them. The Vikings lacked the equipment for a siege against Aba and a developed doctrine of siege craft, having tailored their methods of fighting to rapid strikes and unimpeded retreats to well-defended fortifications. The only means left to them was to starve the Ba into submission but this gave the king time to send his field army or garrisons from neighboring Bas along the army roads. In such cases, the Vikings were extremely vulnerable to pursuit by the king's joint military forces. Alfred's Ba system posed such a formidable challenge against Viking attack that when the Vikings returned in 892 and stormed a half-built, poorly garrisoned fortress up the Limpney estuary in Kent, the Anglo-Saxons were able to limit their penetration to the outer frontiers of Wessex and Mercia. Alfred's Burgol system was revolutionary in its strategic conception and potentially expensive in its execution. His contemporary biographer Asser wrote that many nobles balked at the demands placed upon them even though they were for the common needs of the kingdom. English Navy Alfred also tried his hand at naval design. In 896 he ordered the construction of a small fleet, perhaps a dozen or so longships that, at 60 oars, were twice the size of Viking warships. This was not, as the Victorians asserted, the birth of the English navy. Wessex had possessed a royal fleet before this. Alfred's older brother Subking Ethelstan of Kent and Alderman Ilhera had defeated a Viking fleet in 851 capturing nine ships and Alfred had conducted naval actions in 882. The year 897 marked an important development in the naval power of Wessex. The author of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle related that Alfred's ships were larger, swifter, steadier, and rode higher in the water than either Danish or Frisian ships. It is probable that, under the classical tutelage of Asser, Alfred used the design of Greek and Roman warships, with high sides, designed for fighting rather than for navigation. Alfred had sea power in mind, if he could intercept raiding fleets before they landed he could spare his kingdom from being ravaged. Alfred's ships may have been superior in conception, but in practice they proved to be too large to maneuver well in the close waters of estuaries and rivers, the only places in which a naval battle could be fought. The warships of the time were not designed to be ship killers but rather troop carriers. It has been suggested that, like sea battles in late Viking Age Scandinavia, these battles may have entailed a ship coming alongside an opposing vessel, lashing the two ships together and then boarding the craft. The result was a land battle involving hand-to-hand -hand fighting on board the two lashed vessels. In the one recorded naval engagement in 896, Alfred's new fleet of nine ships intercepted six Viking ships at the mouth of an unidentified river in the south of England. The Danes had beached half their ships and gone inland. Alfred's ships immediately moved to block their escape. The three Viking ships afloat attempted to break through the English lines. Only one made it, Alfred's ships intercepted the other two. Lashing the Viking boats to their own, the English crew boarded and proceeded to kill the Vikings. One ship escaped because Alfred's heavy ships became grounded when the tide went out. A land battle ensued between the crews. The Danes were heavily outnumbered, but as the tide rose, they returned to their boats which, with shallower drafts, were freed first. The English watched as the Vikings rowed past them but they suffered so many casualties that they had difficulty putting out to sea. All were too damaged to row around Sussex, and two were driven against the Sussex coast. The shipwrecked crew were brought before Alfred at Winchester and hanged. Legal Reform In the late 880s or early 890s, Alfred issued a long Dombach or law code consisting of his own laws, followed by a code issued by his late 7th century predecessor King Ione of Wessex. Together these laws are arranged into 120 chapters. In his introduction Alfred explains that he gathered together the laws he found in many synod books and ordered to be written many of the ones that our forefathers observed those that pleased me, and many of the ones that did not please me, I rejected with the advice of my counselors, 
and commanded them to be observed in a different way. Alfred singled out in particular the laws that he found in the days of Ine, my kinsman, or Afa, king of the Mercians, or King Ethelberhide of Kent who first among the English people received baptism. He appended, rather than integrated, the laws of Ine into his code and although he included, as had Ethelbert, a scale of payments in compensation for injuries to various body parts, the two injury tariffs are not aligned. Offa is not known to have issued a law code, leading historian Patrick Warmold to speculate that Alfred had in mind the legate in Capitulary of 786 that was presented to Offa by two papal legates. About a fifth of the law code is taken up by Alfred's introduction, which includes translations into English of the Ten Commandments a few chapters from the book of Exodus, and the apostolic letter from the Acts of the Apostles. The introduction may best be understood as Alfred's meditation upon the meaning of Christian law. It traces the continuity between God's gift of law to Moses to Alfred's own issuance of law to the West Saxon people. By doing so, it linked the holy past to the historical present and represented Alfred's law-giving as a type of divine legislation. Similarly Alfred divided his code into 120 chapters because 120 was the age at which Moses died and, in the number symbolism of early medieval biblical exegetes, 120 stood for law. The link between Mosaic Law and Alfred's Code is the apostolic letter which explained that Christ had come not to shatter or annul the commandments but to fulfill them, and he taught mercy and meekness. The mercy that Christ infused into Mosaic Law underlies the injury tariffs that figure so prominently in barbarian law codes since Christian synods established, through that mercy which Christ taught that for almost every misdeed at the first offense secular lords might with their permission receive without sin the monetary compensation which they then fixed. The only crime that could not be compensated with a payment of money was treachery to a lord since Almighty God adjudged none for those who despised him, nor did Christ, the Son of God, adjudge any for the one who betrayed him to death, and he commanded everyone to love his lord as himself. Alfred's transformation of Christ's commandment, from love your neighbor as yourself to love your secular Lord as you would love the Lord Christ himself, underscores the importance that Alfred placed upon lordship which he understood as a sacred bond instituted by God for the governance of man. When one turns from the Dombach's introduction to the laws themselves, it is difficult to uncover any logical arrangement. The impression is of a hodgepodge of miscellaneous laws. The law code, as it has been preserved, is singularly unsuitable for use in lawsuits. In fact, several of Alfred's laws contradicted the laws of INE that form an integral part of the code. Patrick Warmold's explanation is that Alfred's law code should be understood not as a legal manual but as an ideological manifesto of kingship designed more for symbolic impact than for practical direction. In practical terms the most important law in the code may well have been the first, we enjoin, what is most necessary, that each man keep carefully his oath and his pledge which expresses a fundamental tenet of Anglo-Saxon law. Alfred devoted considerable attention and thought to judicial matters. Asser underscores his concern for judicial fairness. Alfred, according to Asser, insisted upon reviewing contested judgments made by his aldermen and reeves and would carefully look into nearly all the judgments which were passed in his absence anywhere in the realm to see whether they were just or unjust. A charter from the reign of his son Edward the Elder depicts Alfred as hearing one such appeal in his chamber while washing his hands. Asser represents Alfred as a Solomonic judge painstaking in his own judicial investigations and critical of royal officials who rendered unjust or unwise judgments. Although Asser never mentions Alfred's law code he does say that Alfred insisted that his judges be literate so that they could apply themselves to the pursuit of wisdom. The failure to comply with this royal order was to be punished by loss of office. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, commissioned at the time of Alfred, was probably written to promote unification of England, whereas Asser's The Life of King Alfred promoted Alfred's achievements and personal qualities. 
It was possible that the document was designed this way so that it could be disseminated in Wales because Alfred had acquired overlordship of that country. Foreign Relations Asser speaks grandiosely of Alfred's relations with foreign powers but little definite information is available. His interest in foreign countries is shown by the insertions which he made in his translation of Orosius. He corresponded with Elias III, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, and embassies to Rome conveying the English alms to the Pope were fairly frequent. Around 890, Wolf Stan of Hedebi undertook a journey from Hedebi on Jutland along the Baltic Sea to the Prussian trading town of Trousseau. Alfred personally collected details of this trip. Alfred's relations with the Celtic princes in the western half of Great Britain are clearer. Comparatively early in his reign, according to Asser, the southern Welsh princes, owing to the pressure on them from North Wales and Mercia, commended themselves to Alfred. Later in his reign, the North Welsh followed their example and the latter cooperated with the English in the campaign of 893. That Alfred sent alms to Irish and continental monasteries may be taken on Asser's authority. The visit of three pilgrim Scots to Alfred in 891 is undoubtedly authentic. The story that, in his childhood, he was sent to Ireland to be healed by St. Modwena may show Alfred's interest in that island. Religion, Education, and Culture In the 880s, at the same time that he was cajoling and threatening his nobles to build and man the buzz, Alfred, perhaps inspired by the example of Charlemagne almost a century before, undertook an equally ambitious effort to revive learning. During this period, the Viking raids were often seen as a divine punishment, and Alfred may have wished to revive religious awe in order to appease God's wrath. This revival entailed the recruitment of clerical scholars from Mercia, Wales, and abroad to enhance the tenor of the court and of the episcopacy, the establishment of a court school to educate his own children, the sons of his nobles, and intellectually promising boys of lesser birth, an attempt to require literacy in those who held offices of authority. A series of translations into the vernacular of Latin works the king deemed most necessary for all men to know, the compilation of a chronicle detailing the rise of Alfred's kingdom and house, with a genealogy that stretched back to Adam, thus giving the West Saxon kings a biblical ancestry. Very little is known of the church under Alfred. The Danish attacks had been particularly damaging to the monasteries. Although Alfred founded monasteries at Athelney and Shaftesbury, these were the first new monastic houses in Wessex since the beginning of the 8th century. According to Asser, Alfred enticed foreign monks to England for his monastery at Athelney because there was little interest for the locals to take up the monastic life. Alfred undertook no systematic reform of ecclesiastical institutions or religious practices in Wessex. For him, the key to the kingdom's spiritual revival was to appoint pious, learned, and trustworthy bishops and abbots. As king, he saw himself as responsible for both the temporal and spiritual welfare of his subjects. Secular and spiritual authority were not distinct categories for Alfred. He was equally comfortable distributing his translation of Gregory the Great's pastoral care to his bishops so that they might better train and supervise priests and using those same bishops as royal officials and judges. Nor did his piety prevent him from expropriating strategically cited church lands, especially estates along the border with the Danelaw and transferring them to royal thanes and officials who could better defend them against Viking attacks. Effect of Danish Raids on Education The Danish raids had a devastating effect on learning in England. Alfred lamented in the preface to his translation of Gregory's pastoral care that learning had declined so thoroughly in England that there were very few men on this side of the Humber who could understand their divine services in English or even translate a single letter from Latin into English, and I suppose that there were not many beyond the Humber either. Alfred undoubtedly exaggerated, for dramatic effect, the abysmal state of learning in England during his youth. 
That Latin learning had not been obliterated is evidenced by the presence in his court of learned Mercian and West Saxon clerics such as Plegmund, Wayforth, and Wolfsich. Manuscript production in England dropped off precipitously around the 860s when the Viking invasions began in earnest, not to be revived until the end of the century. Numerous Anglo Saxon manuscripts burnt along with the churches that housed them. A solemn diploma from Christ Church, Canterbury, dated 873, is so poorly constructed and written that historian Nicholas Brooks posited a scribe who was either so blind he could not read what he wrote or who knew little or no Latin. It is clear, Brooks concludes, that the Metropolitan Church must have been quite unable to provide any effective training in the scriptures or in Christian worship. Establishment of a Court School Alfred established a court school for the education of his own children, those of the nobility, and a good many of lesser birth. There they studied books in both English and Latin and devoted themselves to writing, to such an extent, they were seen to be devoted and intelligent students of the liberal arts. He recruited scholars from the continent and from Britain to aid in the revival of Christian learning in Wessex and to provide the king personal instruction. Grimbald and John the Saxon came from Francia, Plegmund, Bishop Werfrith of Worcester, Ethelstan, and the royal chaplains Werewolf, from Mercia, and Asser, from St. David's in southwestern Wales. Advocacy of Education in English Alfred's educational ambitions seem to have extended beyond the establishment of a court school. Believing that without Christian wisdom there can be neither prosperity nor success in war, Alfred aimed to set to learning all the free-born young men now in England who have the means to apply themselves to it. Conscious of the decay of Latin literacy in his realm, Alfred proposed that primary education be taught in English, with those wishing to advance to holy orders to continue their studies in Latin. There were few books of wisdom written in English. Alfred sought to remedy this through an ambitious court-centered program of translating into English the books he deemed most necessary for all men to know. It is unknown when Alfred launched this program, but it may have been during the 880s when Wessex was enjoying a respite from Viking attacks. Alfred was, until recently, often considered to have been the author of many of the translations, but this is now considered doubtful in almost all cases. Scholars more often refer to translations as Alfredian, indicating that they probably had something to do with his patronage, but are unlikely to be his own work. Apart from the Lost Handbook or Enchiridio, which seems to have been a commonplace book kept by the king, the earliest work to be translated was the Dialogues of Gregory the Great, a book greatly popular in the Middle Ages. The translation was undertaken at Alfred's command by Werfrith. Bishop of Worcester, with the king merely furnishing a preface. Remarkably, Alfred undoubtedly with the advice and aid of his court scholars translated four works himself, Gregory the Great's Pastoral Care, Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, St. Augustine's Soliloquies and the first fifty Psalms of the Psalter. Point one might add to this list the translation, in Alfred's Law Code, of excerpts from the Vulgate Book of Exodus. The Old English versions of Orogius's histories against the pagans and Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people are no longer accepted by scholars as Alfred's own translations because of lexical and stylistic differences. Nonetheless, the consensus remains that they were part of the Alfredian program of translation. Simon Keynes and Michael Lapage suggest this also for Bald's Leech Book and the anonymous Old English Martyrology. The preface of Alfred's translation of Pope Gregory the Great's pastoral care explained why he thought it necessary to translate works such as this from Latin into English. Although he described his method as translating sometimes word for word, sometimes sense for sense, the translation keeps very close to the original, although, through his choice of language, he blurred throughout the distinction between spiritual and secular authority. Alfred meant the translation to be used, and circulated it to all his bishops. 
Interest in Alfred's translation of pastoral care was so enduring that copies were still being made in the 11th century. Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy was the most popular philosophical handbook of the Middle Ages. Unlike the translation of the pastoral care, the Alfredian text deals very freely with the original end, though the late Dr. G. Skeps showed that many of the additions to the text are to be traced not to the translator himself but to the glosses and commentaries which he used, still there is much in the work which is distinctive to the translation and has been taken to reflect philosophies of kingship in Alfred's milieu. It is in the Boethius that the oft-quoted sentence occurs, to speak briefly, I desired to live worthily as long as I lived, and after my life to leave to them that should come after, my memory in good works. The book has come down to us in two manuscripts only. In one of these the writing is prose, in the other a combination of prose and alliterating verse. The latter manuscript was severely damaged in the 18th and 19th centuries. The last of the Alfred I. N. works is one which bears the name Blistman or Anthology. The first half is based mainly on the soliloquies of St. Augustine of Hippo, the remainder is drawn from various sources. The material has traditionally been thought to contain much that is Alfred's own and highly characteristic of him. The last words of it may be quoted, they form a fitting epitaph for the noblest of English kings. Therefore, he seems to me a very foolish man, and truly wretched who will not increase his understanding while he is in the world, and ever wish and long to reach that endless life where all shall be made clear. Alfred appears as a character in the 12th or 13th century poem The Owl and the Nightingale where his wisdom and skill with proverbs is praised. The Proverbs of Alfred, a 13th century work, contains sayings that are not likely to have originated with Alfred but attest to his posthumous medieval reputation for wisdom. The Alfred Jewel, discovered in Somerset in 1693, has long been associated with King Alfred because of its Old English inscription Ilfred Mech Heht Joerkin. The jewel is about 2 plus 1 2 inches long, made of filigreed gold, enclosing a highly polished piece of quartz crystal beneath which is set in a cloisonne enamel plaque with an enameled image of a man holding floriate scepters perhaps personifying sight or the wisdom of God. It was at one time attached to a thin rod or stick based on the hollow socket at its base. The jewel certainly dates from Alfred's reign. Although its function is unknown, it has been often suggested that the jewel was one of the Estel's pointers for reading that Alfred ordered sent to every bishopric accompanying a copy of his translation of the pastoral care. Each estel was worth the princely sum of fifty mancuses which fits in well with the quality workmanship and expensive materials of the Alfred Jewel. Historian Richard Abel sees Alfred's educational and military reforms as complementary. Restoring religion and learning in Wessex, Abel's contends, was to Alfred's mind as essential to the defense of his realm as the building of the buzz. As Alfred observed in the preface to his English translation of Gregory the Great's pastoral care, kings who fail to obey their divine duty to promote learning can expect earthly punishments to befall their people. The pursuit of wisdom, he assured his readers of the Boethius, was the surest path to power, study wisdom, then, and, when you have learned it, condemn it not, for I tell you that by its means you may without fail attain to power, Yet, even though not desiring it. The portrayal of the West Saxon resistance to the Vikings by Asser and the Chronicler as a Christian holy war was more than mere rhetoric or propaganda. It reflected Alfred's own belief in a doctrine of divine rewards and punishments rooted in a vision of a hierarchical Christian world order in which God is the Lord to whom kings owe obedience and through whom they derive their authority over their followers. The need to persuade his nobles to undertake work for the common good led Alfred and his court scholars to strengthen and deepen the conception of Christian kingship that he had inherited by building upon the legacy of earlier kings including Offa, clerical writers including Bede and Alcuin, and various participants in the Carolingian Renaissance. This was not a cynical use of religion to manipulate his subjects into obedience but an intrinsic element in Alfred's worldview. He believed as did other kings in 9th century England and Francia, 
that God had entrusted him with the spiritual as well as physical welfare of his people. If the Christian faith fell into ruin in his kingdom, if the clergy were too ignorant to understand the Latin words they butchered in their offices and liturgies, if the ancient monasteries and collegiate churches lay deserted out of indifference, he was answerable before God, as Josiah had been. Alfred's ultimate responsibility was the pastoral care of his people. Appearance and Character Asser wrote of Alfred in his life of King Alfred. Now, he was greatly loved, more than all his brothers, by his father and mother indeed, by everybody with a universal and profound love, and he was always brought up in the royal court and nowhere else, was seen to be more comely in appearance than his other brothers and more pleasing in manner, speech, and behavior, in spite of all the demands of the present life, it has been the desire for wisdom, more than anything else, together with the nobility of his birth, which have characterized the nature of his noble mind. It is also written by Asser that Alfred did not learn to read until he was twelve years old or later, which is described as shameful negligence of his parents and tutors. Alfred was an excellent listener and had an incredible memory and he retained poetry and psalms very well. A story is told by Asser about how his mother held up a book of Saxon poetry to him and his brothers, and said, I shall give this book to whichever one of you can learn it the fastest. After excitedly asking, Will you really give this book to the one of us who can understand it the soonest and recite it to you? Alfred then took it to his teacher, learned it and recited it back to his mother. Alfred is noted as carrying around a small book, probably a medieval version of a small pocket notebook, that contained psalms and many prayers that he often collected. Asser writes, These he collected in a single book, as I have seen for myself, amid all the affairs of the present life he took it around with him everywhere for the sake of prayer, and was inseparable from it. An excellent hunter in every branch of the sport, Alfred is remembered as an enthusiastic huntsman against whom nobody's skills could compare. Although he was the youngest of his brothers, he was probably the most open minded. He was an early advocate for education. His desire for learning could have come from his early love of English poetry and inability to read or physically record it until later in life. Asser writes that Alfred could not satisfy his craving for what he desired the most, namely the liberal arts. For, as he used to say, there were no good scholars in the entire kingdom of the West Saxons at that time. Family Alfred was a son of Ethelwulf, king of Wessex, and his wife Osburgh. According to his biographer, Asser, writing in 893, in the year of our Lord's incarnation 849 Alfred, king of the Anglo-Saxons, was born at the royal estate called Wantage, in the district known as Berkshire. This date has been accepted by the editors of Asser's biography, Simon Keynes and Michael Lapage, and by other historians such as David Dumville and Richard Huscroft. West Saxon genealogical lists state that Alfred was 23 when he became king in April 871 implying that he was born between April 847 and April 848. This dating is adopted in the biography of Alfred by Alfred Smith, who regards Asser's biography as fraudulent, an allegation which is rejected by other historians. Richard Abels in his biography discusses both sources but does not decide between them and dates Alfred's birth as 847-849 while Patrick Warmeld in his Oxford Dictionary of National Biography article dates at 848-849. Berkshire had been historically disputed between Wessex and the Midland Kingdom of Mercia, and as late as 844, a charter showed that it was part of Mercia, but Alfred's birth in the county is evidence that, by the late 840s, control had passed to Wessex. He was the youngest of six children. His eldest brother, Ethelstan, was old enough to be appointed sub-king of Kent in 839, almost ten years before Alfred was born. He died in the early 850s. Alfred's next three brothers were successively kings of Wessex. 
Ethelbald and Ethelberheit were also much older than Alfred, but Ethelred was only a year or two older. Alfred's only known sister, Ethelswith, married Burgred, king of Mercia in 853. Most historians think that Osburgh was the mother of all Ethelwulf's children, but some suggest that the older ones were born to an unrecorded first wife. Osburgh was descended from the rulers of the Isle of Wight. She was described by Alfred's biographer Asser as a most religious woman, noble by temperament and noble by birth. She had died by 856 when Ethelwulf married Judith, daughter of Charles the Bald, king of West Francia. In 868, Alfred married Ilhaswith, daughter of the Mercian nobleman Ethelred Musel, alderman of the Gainey, and his wife Edburh, who was of royal Mercian descent. Their children were Ethelflaed, who married Ethelred, lord of the Mercians, Edward the Elder, Alfred's successor as king, Ethelgefu, abbess of Shaftesbury, Ilfthrith, who married Baldwin, count of Flanders, and Ethelward. Death and Burial Alfred died on October 26, 899 at the age of 50 or 51. How he died is unknown but he suffered throughout his life with a painful and unpleasant illness. His biographer Asser gave a detailed description of Alfred's symptoms, and this has allowed modern doctors to provide a possible diagnosis. It is thought that he had either Crohn's disease or hemorrhoids. His grandson King Edred seems to have had a similar illness. Alfred was temporarily buried at the Old Minster in Winchester with his wife Ilhaswith and later, his son Edward the Elder. Before his death he ordered the construction of the new minster hoping that it would become a mausoleum for him and his family. Four years after his death, the bodies of Alfred and his family were exhumed and moved to their new resting place in the new minster and remained there for 211 years. When William the Conqueror rose to the English throne after the Norman conquest in 1066, many Anglo-Saxon abbeys were demolished and replaced with Norman cathedrals. One of those unfortunate abbeys was the very new Minster Abbey where Alfred was laid to rest. Before demolition, the monks at the new Minster exhumed the bodies of Alfred and his family to safely transfer them to a new location. The new Minster monks moved to Hyde in 1110 a little north of the city, and they transferred to Hyde Abbey along with Alfred's body and those of his wife and children which were interred before the high altar. In 1536, many Roman Catholic churches were vandalized by the people of England spurred by disillusionment with the church during the dissolution of the monasteries. One such Catholic church was the site of Alfred's burial, Hyde Abbey. Once again, Alfred's place of rest was disturbed for the now third time. Hyde Abbey was dissolved in 1538 during the reign of Henry VIII, the church site was demolished and treated like a quarry, as the stones that made up the abbey were then reused in local architecture. The stone graves housing Alfred and his family stayed underground, and the land returned to farming. These graves remained intact until 1788 when the site was acquired by the county for the construction of a town jail. Before construction began, convicts that would later be imprisoned at the site were sent in to prepare the ground, to ready it for building. While digging the foundation trenches, the convicts discovered the coffins of Alfred and his family. The local Catholic priest, Dr. Milner recounts this event thus miscreants couch amidst the ashes of our Alfreds and Edwards and where once religious silence and contemplation were only interrupted by the bell of regular observance, the chanting of devotion, now alone resound the clank of the captive's chains and the oaths of the profligate. In digging for the foundation of that mournful edifice, at almost every stroke of the mattock or spade some ancient sepulchre was violated, the venerable contents of which were treated with marked indignity. On this occasion a great number of stone coffins were dug up with a variety of other curious articles, such as chalices, patens, rings, buckles, the leather of shoes and boots, velvet and gold lace belonging to chasubles and other vestments, as also the crook, 
rims, and joints of a beautiful crozier double gilt. The convicts broke the stone coffins into pieces, the lead, which lined the coffins, was sold for two guineas, and the bones within scattered around the area. The prison was demolished. Between 1846 and 1850, Further excavations were inconclusive in 1866 and 1897. In 1866, amateur antiquarian John Meller claimed to have recovered a number of bones from the site which he said were those of Alfred. These came into the possession of the vicar of nearby St. Bartholomew's Church who reburied them in an unmarked grave in the church graveyard. Excavations conducted by the Winchester Museum Service of the Hyde Abbey site in 1999 located a second pit dug in front of where the high altar would have been located, which was identified as probably dating to Meller's 1866 excavation. The 1999 archaeological excavation uncovered the foundations of the abbey buildings and some bones, suggested at the time to be those of Alfred, they proved instead to belong to an elderly woman. In March 2013, the Diocese of Winchester exhumed the bones from the unmarked grave at St. Bartholomew's and placed them in secure storage. The diocese made no claim that they were the bones of Alfred but intended to secure them for later analysis, and from the attentions of people whose interest may have been sparked by the recent identification of the remains of King Richard III. The bones were radiocarbon dated but the results showed that they were from the 1300s and therefore not of Alfred. In January 2014, a fragment of pelvis that had been unearthed in the 1999 excavation of the Hyde site, and had subsequently lain in a Winchester Museum storeroom, was radiocarbon dated to the correct period. It has been suggested that this bone may belong to either Alfred or his son Edward, but this remains unproven. Legacy Though Henry VI of England attempted unsuccessfully to have Alfred canonized by Pope Eugene IV in 1441, he was venerated sometimes in the Catholic Church. The current Roman martyrology does not mention Alfred. The Anglican Communion venerates him as a Christian hero, with a lesser festival on October 26, and he may often be found depicted in stained glass in Church of England parish churches. Alfred commissioned Bishop Asser to write his biography, which inevitably emphasized Alfred's positive aspects. Later medieval historians such as Geoffrey of Monmouth also reinforced Alfred's favorable image. By the time of the Reformation, Alfred was seen as a pious Christian ruler who promoted the use of English rather than Latin, and so the translations that he commissioned were viewed as untainted by the later Roman Catholic influences of the Normans. Consequently, it was writers of the 16th century who gave Alfred his epithet as the Great, not any of Alfred's contemporaries. The epithet was retained by succeeding generations who admired Alfred's patriotism, success against barbarism, promotion of education, and establishment of the rule of law. A number of educational establishments are named in Alfred's honor. The University of Winchester created from the former King Alfred's College, Winchester. Alfred University and Alfred State College in Alfred, New York, the local telephone exchange for Alfred University is 871 in commemoration of the year of Alfred's ascension to the throne. Additionally, the mascot of Alfred University is named Lil Alf and is modeled after the king. The University of Liverpool created a King Alfred Chair of English Literature. King Alfred's Academy, a secondary school in Wantage, Oxfordshire, the birthplace of Alfred. King's Lodge School in Chippenham, Wiltshire, so named because King Alfred's hunting lodge is reputed to have stood on or near the site of the school. The King Alfred School and Specialist Sports Academy, Burnham Road, Highbridge, so named due to its rough proximity to Brent Knoll and Athelney. The King Alfred School in Barnet, North London, UK. King Alfred's House in Bishop Stopford's School at Enfield. King Alfred Swimming Pool and Leisure Complex in Hove, 
Brighton UK The Royal Navy named one ship and two shore establishments HMS King Alfred, and one of the early ships of the US Navy was named USS Alfred in his honor. In 2002, Alfred was ranked number 14 in the BBC's list of the 100 Greatest Britons following a UK-wide vote. Statues Southwark. A statue of Alfred the Great located in Trinity Church Square, Southwark is considered to be the oldest outdoor statue in London, and part of it has been found to date to Roman times. The sculpture was thought medieval until 2021 conservation work. The lower half was then discovered to be bath stone and part of a colossal ancient sculpture dedicated to the goddess Minerva. It is typical of the 2nd century, dating to around the reign of Hadrian. The lower older half is likely to have been carved by a continental craftsman used to working with British stone. The upper half is relatively modern, made from artificial Coaday stone. Winchester a bronze statue of Alfred the Great stands at the eastern end of the Broadway, close to the site of Winchester's medieval East Gate. The statue was designed by Homo Thornycroft, cast in bronze by Singer and Sons of Frome and erected in 1899 to mark 1,000 years since Alfred's death. The statue is placed on a pedestal consisting of two immense blocks of grey Cornish granite. Pusey a prominent statue of King Alfred the Great stands in the middle of Pusey. It was unveiled in June 1913 to commemorate the coronation of King George V. Wantage A statue of Alfred the Great, situated in the Wantage Market Place, was sculpted by Count Glycan, a relative of Queen Victoria, and unveiled on July 14, 1877 by the Prince and Princess of Wales. The statue was vandalized on New Year's Eve 2007, losing part of its right arm and axe. After the arm and axe were replaced, the statue was again vandalized on Christmas Eve 2008, losing its axe. Alfred University, New York The centerpiece of Alfred University's quad is a bronze statue of the king, created in 1990 by then-professor William Underhill. It features the king as a young man, holding a shield in his left hand and an open book in his right. Cleveland, Ohio A marble statue of Alfred the Great stands on the north side of the Cuyahoga County Courthouse in Cleveland, Ohio. It was sculpted by Isidore Conti in 1910. Chronology Notes <laughs>